Hi everyone, happy Thursday. Mrs. Wilson here, continuing with Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. So far, uh, we've been introduced to the new Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher, Gilderoy Lockhart. He um, started their very first class yesterday, and though he talks a big game, in his class, he introduced them to these Cornish pixies that he wasn't even able to take care of himself and instead left Ron, Hermione, and Harry to take care of. So he's a bit interesting and a very curious, for sure, character. So this is how the chapter ended. Can you believe him, roared Ron, as one of the remaining pixies bit him painfully on the ear. He just wants to give us some hands-on experience, said Hermione, immobilizing two pixies at once with a clever freezing charm and stuffing them back into their cage. Hands-on, said Harry, who was trying to grab a pixie dancing out of reach with its tongue out. Hermione, he didn't have a clue what he was doing. Rubbish, said Hermione. You've read his books. Look at all those amazing things he's done. He says he's done, Ron muttered. And that's how the chapter ended. Today, chapter 7 is titled... Mud bloods and murmurs, and we know that what a murmur is, um, it's kind of like when there are rumors or things that are being kind of spoken of on the down low. But mud bloods, I'm not familiar with that term, and so we're going to find out what those are in the magical realm. Harry spent a lot of time over the next few days dodging out of sight whenever he saw Gilderoy Lockhart coming down a corridor. Harder to avoid was Colin Creevy, who seemed to have memorized Harry's schedule. Nothing seemed to give Colin a bigger thrill than to say, All right, Harry, six or seven times a day. And here, hello, Colin, back, however exasperated Harry sounded when he said it. Hedwig was still angry with Harry about the disastrous car journey, and Ron's wand was still malfunctioning, surpassing itself on Friday morning by shooting out of Ron's hand in charms and hitting tiny old Professor Flitwick squarely between the eyes, creating a large throbbing green boil where it had struck. Oh, poor Professor Flitwick. So, with one thing and another, Harry was quite glad to reach the weekend. He, Ron, and Hermione were planning to visit Hagrid on Saturday morning. Harry, however, was shaken awake several hours earlier than he would have liked by Oliver Wood, captain of the Gryffindor Quidditch team. What's the matter? said Harry groggily. Quidditch practice, said Wood. Come on! Harry squinted at the window. There was a thin mist hanging across the pink and gold sky. Now that he was awake, he couldn't understand how he could have slept through the racket the birds were making. Oliver, croaked Harry, it's the crack of dawn. Exactly, said Wood. He was a tall and burly sixth year, and at the moment his eyes were gleaming with a crazed enthusiasm. It's part of our new training program. Come on, grab your broom and let's go, said Wood heartily. None of the other teams have started training yet. We're going to be first off the mark this year. Yawning and shivering slightly, Harry climbed out of bed and tried to find his Quidditch robes. Good man, said Wood. Meet you on the field in fifteen minutes. When he'd found his scarlet team robes and pulled on his cloak for warmth, Harry scribbled a note to Ron explaining where he'd gone and went down the spiral staircase to the common room, his Nimbus 2000 on his shoulder. He'd just reached the portrait hole when there was a clatter behind him and Colin Creepy came dashing down the spiral staircase, his camera swinging madly around his neck and something clutched in his hand. I heard someone say your name on the stairs, Harry. Look what I've got here. I've had it developed. I want to show you. Harry looked bemusedly at the photograph Colin was brandishing under his nose. A moving black and white Lockhart was tugging hard on an arm Harry recognized as his own. He was pleased to see that his photographic self was putting up a good fight and refusing to be dragged into view. As Harry watched, Lockhart gave up and slumped panting against the white edge of the picture. "'Will you sign it?' said Colin eagerly. "'No,' said Harry flatly, glancing around to check that the room was really deserted. "'Sorry, Colin, I'm in a hurry. Quidditch practice.' He climbed through the portrait hole. "'Oh, wow! Wait for me! I've never watched a Quidditch game before!' Colin scrambled through the hole after him. "'It'll be really boring,' Harry said quickly, but Colin ignored him, his face shining with excitement. "'You were the youngest house player in a hundred years, weren't you, Harry? Weren't you?' said Colin, trotting alongside him. You must be brilliant. I've never flown. Is it easy? Is that your own broom? Is that the best one there is? Harry didn't know how to get rid of him. It was like having an extremely talkative shadow. I don't really understand Quidditch, said Colin breathlessly. Is it true there are four balls? Are two of them fl flying around trying to knock people off their brooms? 
Yes, said Harry, heavily resigned to explaining the complicated rules of Quidditch. They're called bludgers. There are two beaters on each team who carry clubs to bear the bludgers, beat the bludgers away from their side. Fred and George Weasley are the Gryffindor beaters. And what are the other balls for? Colin asked, tripping down a couple of steps because he was gazing open-mouthed at Harry. Well, the quaffle, that's the biggish red one, is the one that scores goals. Three chasers on each team throw the quaffle to each other and try and get it through the goalposts at the end of the pitch. There are three long poles with hoops on the end. And the fourth ball is the golden snitch, said Harry, and it's very small, very fast, and difficult to catch. But that's what the seekers got to do, because a game of Quidditch doesn't end until the snitch has been caught. And whichever team seeker gets the snitch earns his team an extra 150 points. And you're the Gryffindor seeker, aren't you, said Colin in awe. Yes, said Harry as they left the castle and started across the dew-drenched grass. And there's the keeper, too. He guards the goal posts. That's it, really. But Colin didn't stop questioning. Harry all the way down the sloping lawns to the Quidditch field, and Harry only shook him off when he reached the changing rooms. Colin called after him in a piping voice. I'll go and get a good seat, Harry, and hurried off to the stands. The rest of the Gryffindor team were already in the changing room. Wood was the only person who looked truly awake. Fred and George Weasley were sitting puffy-eyed and tussle-haired next to fourth-year Alicia Spinnett, who seemed to be nodding off against the wall behind her. Her fellow chasers, Katie Bell and Angelina Johnson, were yawning side by side opposite them. "'There you are, Harry. What's kept you?' said Wood briskly. "'Now, I wanted a quick talk with you all before we actually get onto the field "'because I spent the summer devising a whole new training program "'which I really think will make all the difference.' "'Wood was holding up a large diagram of a Quidditch field "'on which were drawn many lines, arrows, and crosses in different colored inks. "'He took out his wand, tapped the board, "'and arrows began to wiggle over the diagram like caterpillars.' As Wood launched into a speech about his new tactics, Fred Weasley's head drooped right onto Alicia Spinach's shoulders and began to snore. The first board took nearly 20 minutes to explain, but there was another board under that and a third one under that. Harry sank into a stupor as Wood droned on and on. So, said Wood at long last, jerking Harry from a wistful fantasy about what he could be eating for breakfast at this very moment up at the castle, is that clear? Are there any questions? I've got a question, Oliver, said George, who had woken with a start. Why couldn't you have told us this yesterday when we were awake? Wood wasn't pleased. Now, listen here, you lot, he said, glowering at them all. We should have won the Quidditch Cup last year. We're easily the best team, but unfortunately, owing to the circumstances beyond our control, Harry shifted guiltily in his seat. He'd been unconscious in the hospital wing for the final match the previous year meaning that Gryffindor had been a player short and had suffered their worst defeat in 300 years. Wood still took a moment to regain control of himself. Their last defeat was clearly still torturing him. So this year we train harder than ever before. Okay, let's go and put our new theories into practice, Wood shouted, seizing his broomstick and leading the way out of the locker rooms. Stiff-legged and still yawning, his team followed. They'd been in the locker room so long that the sun was up completely now, although remnants of mist hung over the grass in the stadium. As Harry walked onto the field, he saw Ron and Hermione sitting in the stands. "'Aren't you finished yet?' called Ron incredulously. "'Haven't even started,' said Harry, looking jealously at the toast and marmalade Ron and Hermione had brought out of the great hall. "'Wood's been teaching us new moves.' He mounted his broomstick and kicked at the ground, soaring up into the air. The cool morning air whipped his face, waking him far more effectively than Wood's long talk. It felt wonderful to be back on the Quidditch field. He soared right around the stadium at full speed, racing Fred and George. What's that funny clicking noise, said Fred as they hurtled around the corner. Harry looked into the stands. Colin was sitting in one of the high seats, his camera raised, taking picture after picture. The sound strangely magnified in the deserted stadium. Look this way, Harry, this way, he cried shrilly. Who is that, said Fred. No idea, Harry lied, putting on a spurt of speed that took him as far away as possible from Colin. What's going on, said Wood, frowning as he skimmed through the air toward them. Why is that first year taking pictures? I don't like it. He could be a Slytherin spy trying to find out about our new training program. He's in Gryffindor, said Harry quickly. And the Slytherins don't need a spy, Oliver, said George. What makes you say that, said Wood testily. Because they're here in person, said George, pointing. Several people in green robes were walking onto the field, broomsticks in their hands. 
I don't believe it, Wood hissed in outrage. I booked the field for today. We'll see about this. Wood shot toward the ground, landing rather harder than he meant to in his anger, staggering slightly as he dismounted. Harry, Fred, and George followed. Flint, Wood bellowed at the Slytherin captain. This is our practice time. We got up specially. You can clear off now. Marcus Flint was even larger than Wood, and he had a look of trollish cunning on his face as he replied, Plenty of room for all of us, Wood. Angelina, Alicia, and Katie had come over, too. There were no girls on the Slytherin team who stood shoulder to shoulder facing the Gryffindors, leaning or leering to a man. But I booked the field, said Wood, positively spitting with rage. I booked it. Ah, uh, said Flint, but I got a specially signed note here from Professor Snape. I, Professor S. Snape, give the Slytherins team permission to practice today on the Quidditch field, owing to the need to train their new seeker. You've got a new seeker, said Wood, distracted. Where? And from behind the six large figures before them came a seventh smaller boy, smirking all over his pale, pointed face. It was Draco Malfoy. Aren't you Lucius Malfoy's son, said Fred, looking at Malfoy with dislike. Funny you should mention Draco's father, said Flint, as the whole Slytherin team smiled still more broadly. Let me show you the generous gift he's made to the Slytherin team. All seven of them held out their broomsticks. Seven highly polished brand new handles and seven sets of fine gold lettering spelling the words Nimbus 2001 gleamed under the Gryffindor's noses in the early morning sun. It's the very latest model. Only came out last month, said Flint, carelessly flicking a speck of dust from the end of his own. I believe it outstrips the old 2000 series by a considerable amount. As for the old clean sweeps, he smiled nastily at Fred and George, who were clutching, both clutching clean sweep fives, sweeps the board with them. None of the Gryffindor team could think of anything to say for a moment. Malfoy was smirking so broadly his cold eyes were reduced to slits. Oh, look, said Flint, a field invasion. Ron and Hermione were crossing the grass to see what was going on. What's happening, Ron asked Harry. Why aren't you playing, and what's he doing here? He was looking at Malfoy, taking in his Slytherin Quidditch robes. I'm the new Slytherin seeker, Weasley, said Malfoy, smugly. Everyone's just been admiring the brooms my father's bought our team. Ron gaped open-mouthed at the seven superb broomsticks in front of him. Good, aren't they, said Malfoy smoothly. But perhaps the Gryffindor team will be able to raise some gold and get new brooms, too. You could raffle off those clean sweep fives. I expect a museum would bid for them. The Slytherin team howled with laughter. At least no one on the Gryffindor team had to buy their way in, said Hermione sharply. They got in on pure talent. The smug look on Malfoy's face flickered. No one asked your opinion, you filthy little mudblood, he spat. Harry knew at once that Malfoy had said something really bad, because there was an instant uproar at his words. Flint had to dive in front of Malfoy to stop Fred and George jumping on him. Alicia shrieked, How dare you! And Ron plunged his hand into his robes, pulling out his wand, yelling, You'll pay for that one, Malfoy! and pointed it furiously under Flint's arm at Malfoy's face. A loud bang echoed around the stadium and a jet of green light shot out at the wrong end of Ron's wand, hitting him in the stomach and sending him reeling backward into the grass. Ron, Ron, are you all right, squealed Hermione. Ron opened his mouth to speak, but no words came out. Instead, he gave an almighty belch and several slugs dribbled out of his mouth onto his lap. The Slytherin team were paralyzed with laughter. Flint was doubled up, hanging onto his new broomstick for support. Malfoy was on all fours, banging the ground with his fist. The Gryffindors were gathered round Ron, who kept belching large, glistening slugs. Nobody seemed to want to touch him. We'd get her be better get him to Hagrid's. It's nearest, said Harry to Hermione, who nodded bravely, and the pair of them pulled Ron up by the arms. What happened, Harry? What happened? Is he ill? But you can cure him, can't you? Colin had run down from his seat and was now dancing alongside them as they left the field. Ron gave a huge heave and more slugs dribbled down his front. Ooh, said Colin, fascinated and raising his camera. Can you hold him still, Harry? Get out of the way, Colin, said Harry angrily. He and Hermione supported Ron out of the stadium and across the grounds toward the edge of the forest. 
We're nearly there, Ron, said Hermione as the gamekeeper's cabin came into view. You'll be all right in a minute. Almost there. They were within 20 feet of Hagrid's house when the front door opened, but it wasn't Hagrid who emerged. Gilderoy Lockhart, wearing robes of the palest mauve today, came striding out. Quick, behind here, Harry hissed, dragging Ron behind a nearby bush. Hermione followed somewhat reluctantly. It's a simple matter, if you know what you're doing, Lockhart was saying loudly to Hagrid. If you need help, you know where I am. I'll let you have a copy of my book. I'm surprised you haven't already got one. I'll sign one tonight and send it over. Well, goodbye, and he strode away toward the castle. Harry waited until Lockhart was out of sight, then pulled Ron out of the bush and up to Hagrid's front door. They knocked urgently. Hagrid appeared at once, looking very grumpy, but his expression brightened when he saw who it was. Been wondering when you're going to come see me. Come in, come in. Thought you might have been Professor Lockhart back again. Harry and Hermione supported Ron over the threshold into the one-room cabin, which had an enormous bed in one corner, a fire crackling merrily in the other. Harry didn't seem perturbed by Ron's, or Hagrid didn't seem perturbed by Ron's slug problem, which Harry hastily explained as he lowered Ron into a chair. Better out than in, he said cheerfully, plunking a large copper basin in front of him. Get them all up, Ron. I don't think there's anything to do except wait for it to stop, said Hermione anxiously, watching Ron bend over the basin. That's a difficult curse to work at at the best of times. But with a broken wand, Hagrid was bussing around making them tea. His boarhound fang was slobbering over Harry. What did Lockhart want with you, Hagrid? Harry asked, scratching fang's ears. Giving me advice on getting kelpies out of a well, growled Hagrid moving a half-plucked rooster off his scrub table and setting down the teapot, like I don't know, and banging on about some banshee he banished. If one word of it was true, I'll eat my kettle. It was most unlike Hagrid to criticize the Hogwarts teacher, and Harry looked at him in surprise. Hermione, however, said in a voice somewhat higher than usual, I think you're being a bit unfair. Professor Dumbledore obviously thought he was the best man for the job. He was the only man for the job, said Hagrid, offering them a plate of treacle toffee, while Ron coughed squelchily into a basin. And I mean the only one. Getting very difficult to find anyone for the dark arts job. People aren't too keen to take it on, see? They're starting to think it's jinxed. No one's lasted long for a while now, so tell me, said Hagrid, jerking his head to Ron. Who's he trying to curse? Malfoy called Hermione something. It must have been really bad because everyone went wild. It was bad, said Ron hoarsely, emerging over the tabletop, looking pale and sweaty. Malfoy called her a mudblood, Hagrid. Ron dived out of sight again as a fresh wave of slugs made their appearance. Hagrid looked outraged. He didn't, he growled at Hermione. He did, she said, but I don't know what it means. I could tell it was really rude, of course. It's about the most insulting thing you could think of, gasped Ron, coming back up. Mudblood's a really foul name for someone who's muggle-born. You know, non-magic parents. There are some wizards, like Malfoy's family, who think they're better than everyone else because they're what people call pure blood. He gave a small burp and a single slug fell onto his outstretched hand. He threw it into the basin and continued. I mean, the rest of us know it doesn't make any difference at all. Look at Neville Longbottom. He's pure blood and he can hardly stand a cauldron the right way. And they haven't invented a spell our Hermione can't do, said Hagrid proudly, making Hermione go a brilliant shade of magenta. It's a disgusting thing to call someone, said Ron, wiping his sweaty brow with a shaking hand. Dirty blood, see? Common blood. It's ridiculous. Most wizards these days are half-blood anyway. If we hadn't married muggles, we'd have died out. He retched and ducked out of sight again. Well, I don't blame you for trying to curse him, Ron, said Hagrid loudly over the thuds of more slugs hitting the basin. Maybe it was a good thing your wand backfired. Spec Lucius Malfoy would have come marching up to school if he'd cursed his son. At least you're not in trouble. Harry would have pointed out that trouble didn't come much worse than having slugs pouring out of your mouth, but he couldn't. Hagrid's treacle toffee had cemented his jaws together. Harry, said Hagrid abruptly, as though a struck by a sudden thought. I got a bone to pick with you. I heard you've been giving out signed photos. How come I ain't got one? Furious, Harry wrenched his teeth apart. I have not been giving out signed photos, he said hotly. If Lockhart's still spreading that around. But then he saw that Hagrid was laughing. I'm only joking, he said, patting Harry genially on the back, sending him face to face 
face first into the table. I knew you hadn't, really. I told Lockhart you didn't need to. You're more famous than him without trying. Oh, I bet he didn't like that, said Harry, sitting up and rubbing his chin. Don't think he did, said Hagrid, his eyes twinkling. And then I told him I'd never read one of his books and he decided to go. Treacle toffee, Ron, he added as Ron reappeared. Uh, no, thanks, said Ron weakly. Better not risk it. Come and see what I've been growing, said Hagrid as Harry and Hermione finished the last of their tea. In the small vegetable patch behind Hagrid's house were a dozen of the largest pumpkins Harry had ever seen. Each was the size of a large boulder. Getting on well, aren't they? said Hagrid happily. For the Halloween feast. Should be big enough by then. What have you been feeding them? said Harry. Hagrid looked over his shoulder to check out that they were alone. Well, I've been giving them, you know, a bit of help. Harry noticed Hagrid's flowery pink umbrella leaning against the back wall of the cabin. Harry had reason to believe before now that this umbrella was not at all was not all that it looked. In fact, he had the strong impression that Hagrid's old school wand was concealed inside it. Hagrid wasn't supposed to use magic. He'd been expelled from Hogwarts in his third year, but Harry had never found out why. Any mention of the matter, and Hagrid would clear his throat loudly <clears throat> and become mysteriously deaf until the subject was changed. An engorgement charm, I suppose, said Hermione, halfway between disapproval and amusement. Well, you've done a good job on them. That's what your little sister said, said Hagrid, nodding at Ron. Met her just yesterday. Hagrid looked sideways, sideways at Harry, his beard twitching. Said she was just looking around the grounds, but I reckon she was hoping she might run into someone else at my house. He winked at Harry. If you ask me, she wouldn't say no to a signed. Oh, shut up, said Harry. Ron snorted with laughter, and the ground was sprayed with slugs. Watch it, Hagrid roared, pulling Ron away from his precious pumpkins. It was nearly lunchtime, and as Harry had only one bit of treacle toffee since dawn, he was keen to get back to the school to eat. They said goodbye to Hagrid and walked back up to the castle, Ron hiccuping occasionally, but only bringing up two very small slugs. They had barely set foot in the cool entrance hall when a voice rang out. There you are, Potter, Weasley. Professor McGonagall is walking toward them, looking stern. You will both do your t detentions this evening. What are we doing, Professor, said Ron, nervously suppressing a burp. You will be polishing the silver in the trophy room with Mr. Filch, said Professor McGonagall, and no magic, Weasley. Elbow grease. Ron gulped. Argus Filch, the caretaker, was loathed by every student at the school. And you, Potter, will be helping Professor Lockhart answer his fan mail, said Professor McGonagall. Oh, no, Professor, can't I go and do the tr trophy room, too? said Harry desperately. Certainly not, said Professor McGonagall, raising her eyebrows. Professor Lockhart requested you particularly. Eight o'clock sharp, both of you. Harry and Ron slouched into the great hall in states of deepest gloom, Hermione behind them wearing a well-you-did-break-the-school-rules sort of expression. Harry didn't enjoy his shepherd's pie as much as he'd thought. Both he and Ron felt they'd got the worst deal. Ugh. Filch will have me there all night, said Ron heavily. No magic? There must be about a hundred cups in that room. I'm no good at muggle cleaning. I'd swap any time, said Harry hollowly. I had loads of practice with the Dursleys. Answering Lockhart's fan mail? He'll be a nightmare. Saturday afternoon seemed to melt away, and in what seemed like no time, it was five minutes to eight, and Harry was dragging his feet along the second floor corridor to Lockhart's office. He gritted his teeth and knocked. The door flew open at once. Lockhart beamed down at him. Ah, there's the scalawag, he said. Come in, Harry, come in. Shining brightly on the walls by the light of many candles were countless framed photographs of Lockhart. He had even signed a few of them. Another large pile lay on his desk. You can address the envelopes, Lockhart told Harry as though this was a huge treat. This first one's to Gladys Gudgeon, bless her, huge fan of mine. The minutes snailed by. Harry let Lockhart's voice wash over him occasionally, saying, Mm-hmm, and right, and yeah. Now and then he caught a phrase like, Fame's a fickle friend, Harry, or celebrity is as celebrity does. Remember that. The candles burned lower and lower, making the light dance over the many moving faces of Lockhart watching him. Harry moved his aching hand over what felt like the thousandth envelope, writing out Veronica Smethley's address. It must be nearly time to leave, Harry thought miserably. Please let it near be nearly time. 
and then he heard something, something quite apart from the spinning of the dying candles and Lockhart's prattle about his fans. It was a voice, a voice to chill the bone marrow, a voice of breathtaking ice-cold venom. Come, come to me, let me rip you, let me tear you, let me kill you. Harry gave a huge jump and a large lilac blot appeared on Veronica Smithley's street. What? he said loudly. I know, said Lockhart. Six solid months at the top of the bestsellers list broke all the records. No, said Harry frantically. That voice. Sorry, said Lockhart, looking puzzled. What voice? That, that voice said, Did you, didn't you hear it? Lockhart was looking at Harry in high astonishment. What are you talking about, Harry? Perhaps you're getting a little drowsy. Great Scott, look at the time. We've been here nearly four hours. I never believed it. The time has flown, hasn't it? Harry didn't answer. He was straining his ears to hear the voice again, but there was no sound now except for Lockhart telling him he mustn't expect a treat like this every time he got detention. Feeling dazed, Harry left. It was so late that the Gryffindor common room was almost empty. Harry went straight up to the dormitory. Ron wasn't back yet. Harry pulled on his pajamas, got into bed, and waited. Half an hour later, Ron arrived nursing his right arm and bringing a strong smell of polish into the darkened room. My muscles have all seized up, he groaned, sinking into his bed. Fourteen times he made me buff up that Quidditch cup before he was satisfied, and then I had another slug attack all over a special awards for services to the school. It took ages to get the slime off. How was it with Lockhart? Keeping his voice low so as not to wake Neville Dean and Seamus, Harry told Ron exactly what he'd heard. And Lockhart said he couldn't hear it, said Ron. Harry could see him frowning in the moonlight. Do you think he was lying? But I don't get it. Even someone invisible would have had to have opened the door. I know, said Harry, lying back on his four-poster and staring at the canopy above him. I don't get it either. So now we know what mudbloods are. Not very nice term. And those murmurs must be what Harry heard when he was in Lockhart's office. So I'm kind of wondering right now if Lockhart could hear it or if it was just something that Harry heard and why would he have only been able to hear it, number one. Number two, who or what would be saying such horrible things? So that concludes chapter seven. Chapter eight, are you ready for this title? The Death Day Party. And that is what's on deck for our Friday reading. And I can't wait to read yet again to y'all. So hopefully you guys have a great Thursday. And take care. We'll be reading with you again very soon. Bye.